was very much happy to see this building, which I'm sure also did not miss any occasion to take as much as to, to bring home. And today it has been a very exciting day, not only for myself, I'm sure for everybody who attended this unique conference on behalf of the BSP group of companies and all the staff of BSP, all the collaborators, all the sponsors. I thank you very much and I thank Professor Porter for his energetic uh, capabilities. I think only he can also do another session, but time is running short for his flight. <laughs> and as long as he gets another day at call, of course. So, uh, I thank everybody and uh, my colleague Sivet has been also of very good help because since five months he has been organizing this event and I can tell you uh, every day we have a new checklist. Every day we have a new checklist and keep going, keep going. And we managed to do that big event and uh, as the CEO of the group I'm very proud and I'm very honored also Professor Porter stepped into BSP school, visited the infrastructure, visited our office upstairs, my office, and Professor Porter uh, is a very humble person today, that, that's what we, what we met, we discovered. So I won't be long, Professor Porter, the floor is yours, so we can address everybody. So we have a Okay. Here we go. Should I hold it or is that it? Okay. Well, uh, I, I am so pleased to uh, to be here. This is, uh, as you many of you know, my first ever visit to Mauritius. I've been all over the world, but I have not had the privilege of being here. I'm, uh, as I said this morning in my conference, this country has been quite a success story. And uh, I think, um, you know, I've been able to see a little bit with my own eyes and meet quite a few business leaders today. And uh, I, I come away from uh, this day very, uh, very excited about the event that we had here. I think this was a world-class event with a tremendous turnout. You know, given the size of this country, to have so many people there it was a great honor to me. Um, my principal focus today in my uh, seminar was to really give some input and guidance to the businesses of Mauritius uh, about strategy, about how to compete more effectively, because I think that the private sector in Mauritius is going to have to move to a higher level. Uh, more sophistication, better strategy, more international, and uh, we talked mostly about that today, but I also uh, did some work on the country. I, I'm advising many government leaders around the world on economic strategy, and, um, and I was able to uh, uh, share some of our thoughts at the meeting about the country. Uh, I also had a chance to discuss it uh, at some length with the president and with some of the other ministers. And, uh, I'm encouraged by the openness, the willingness to learn, uh, the uh, and the tremendous warmth and hospitality you know, of, of, of all of you. So uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that any of you have. Uh, and uh, but I'm so pleased you're here, and thank you for this coverage and uh, for uh, this warm welcome. Thank you. Question. Question to the floor, please. Yes, 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 please. We can uh, outperform our rivals uh, with a difference. You said that Mauritius is a quite a success story. What would be uh, the difference for Mauritius? I'm not talking about the company strategy, but the, the strategy, the country strategy. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, I have uh, not done a deep study of the economy, and uh, if I were to have the best answer to your question, I, I would need to do this work with a team. And, 
uh, engage with the government and the other leaders here to go through this process of diagnosis. Uh, based on my preliminary work, uh, that uh, some of which you saw today, um, I, I think there's a good foundation uh, in the country. Uh, I think, uh, again, the, 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 the success looking backwards has been quite good. But clearly, the country is in a, a slower period now. The rate of progress is not as great. The per capita income isn't growing as fast as it has been. Uh, there's a lot of people that don't have work right now in the country. Um, and I think the underlying causes for that are that Mauritius is having to make a transition. Uh, traditionally, it's had a very sound business environment, very efficient, good incentives, good tax system, good legal system, uh, very welcoming and open country to international uh, people of all nationalities from all over the world. Um, and it's been a relatively uh, efficient, lower cost place to do business in apparel and, and, and a variety of industries like that. You're blessed with some natural endowments, some beautiful coastline and, and scenery. Uh, and I think those strengths were adequate to drive this wave of growth over the last maybe 10 or 15 years. But now, if you're going to continue to go uh, up in terms of income, you have to raise the value added. Uh, and it's not just producing basic goods, it's, it's design, it's sophisticated manufacturing, it's clever marketing, it's internationalization, it's penetrating African markets and, and international markets, uh, not in more basic goods, but in more advanced segments of the market. And uh, I think in order to do that, uh, uh, we're facing some weaknesses here. There's a limited technological capacity in the country. Um, uh, the universities are fine, but uh, we really lack uh, world-class uh, research kind of universities. Uh, the human resources are good. There's a good that sound foundation in terms of basic education, but the skill levels of higher skill and uh, you know, more advanced education are, are limited in, in the country. Uh, there's not enough engineers, there's not enough designers, there's not enough uh, people who can uh, take the uh, productivity uh, of the economy to a different level. And, and there's the need to generate new fields in which the country can uh, compete. And, uh, you know, I'm confident that this country can do it. Uh, the potential is here, but uh, I think we, as, as I was saying today, we need a strategy. And I know there's some plans, but, uh, but I, think, uh, uh, I think there needs to be a, a, a really clear vision for what Mauritius could be. I think people talk about sort of the gateway to Africa. <coughs> I think that's a good idea. That makes some sense. Uh, uh, but um, I, think, I think this is becoming a services <coughs> center. Uh, and I think that makes, makes some, some sense, but uh, I think there needs to be a deeper, uh, deeper long-range plan and, and the country needs to work on some of the weaknesses that I think are making business less productive in infrastructure, communication, internet, uh, bandwidth, capacity, speed. Uh, there's, there's, some, there's some weaknesses in terms of the basic business environment that, that need to be addressed. So, um, you know, without a deeper study, I think that's where I would stop. Uh, but um, I, what, what, I, what I was very taken by today is a, a very much of an openness. Uh, no, nobody today said, oh, nobody felt defensive. Nobody felt like they didn't want to hear the news. In fact, people were kind of hungry for, for hearing, you know, what... I thought was really going on. And I think that's very encouraging. Uh, I hope that the political system and the government leaders are have the same attitude and they're always looking for uh, where, how to do better. Uh, I certainly found the president very, very uh, much in that, in that spirit. So uh, that would be my, my brief answer. I wish I, if I, if I had done a real study, uh, of course I'd have, uh, I have, I have some answers. I, I've done, uh, national strategies in Peru and Colombia and I participated in Korea and 
you know, many, many countries, but uh, that takes that takes a, a much longer project. And so, what I what I'm telling you today is the basis of my you know first preliminary uh, analysis. But when you say about change of paradigm in competition, what would it be for Mauritius? What is this change about? Well, uh, you know, it, what 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 we see in countries is that that you know things don't come out of nowhere in the economy. Uh, uh, what, where where a country develops a, um, a, 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 a a a growth phase, uh, it always comes from building on what you already have and doing it better. So, for example, we have a major participation in the apparel. Uh, in the apparel field, and uh, um, traditionally that's been on you know relatively uh, you know kind of standard basic items, but with design capability, with marketing capability, with more just in time, with better logistics, uh, you, you can move into more advanced segments of the market. Uh, and so that would be an example of added value. You can sell a simple shirt for five dollars, but you can sell a more sophisticated, highly designed one for fifteen dollars. And that's what value added is. It's making what you do more valuable to the customer. In, in, in hospitality and tourism, uh, you can have a visitor that comes here and spends two hundred dollars a day, uh, or you can have that same visitor come and spend five hundred dollars a day, because we have better services, better hotels better attractions, better things to do. And that's value added. That's raising the value added. So I think that's probably where this country is now. Uh, moving from more the more basic uh, products to more sophisticated, advanced, focused, segmented, segmented, higher value, higher value products and services. And uh, I'm sure also that there's some new industries that are going to grow, but those new industries are going to grow out of the traditional industries they're going to be building on the skills that we've started to create and moving into some new areas. So, again, I, I can't tell you exactly what those are because uh, I really hadn't, haven't had the mandate to take this on as, a, as an actual project. There, there, is a, there is a proposition here in, in the country about minimum salary wage. Well, how, how do you think about it? Well, you know, that's a, a question that there's a lot of debate about. We're having the same debate in America now, as you may know. Um, and um, it, it, here's why it's a difficult question. Raising the minimum wage is not a real solution to anything. Uh, the solution is to raise the skill and raise the competitiveness of the economy so that you can earn a higher wage. So that you don't have to have a government mandate that says you raise the raise the wage. Uh, you know, wages in, in China are rising very rapidly. They're not rising because the government's setting the wage. They're rising because the economy is getting more advanced, the technology is better, the workers have more skill, and therefore they're earning a higher wage. So the minimum wage uh, issue is really more of a, a stopgap. Uh, you you want to make sure that your citizens that are working can earn a decent life, you know, that they, that, they, that they have a living wage for their family. You don't want people that are working to be poor. Uh, you don't want anybody to be poor, but particularly people that work hard. You, you want them to. And so the minimum wage is, is, is a vehicle potentially to, uh, you know, provide that backstop. Now, for me, if it were me, rather than a minimum wage, a better policy to achieve the same effect is uh, uh, what, what's called a, uh, you know, sort of a, a, a uh, there's a term uh, where you, you, rather than pay tax, if you have a low wage, you get money back. So if you have a very low income, you get a tax credit. And that way the wage is the same because, see, when you raise the wage, it's almost inevitable that, that means that there will be fewer people employed. Because if the cost of labor goes up, there will be less use of labor. So people that were hiring somebody will no longer hire that person. So raising the wage is, is always a trade-off 
because when you raise the wage, the, the people who most need the employment, which the, the people that don't have a lot of skill, there'll be less jobs for those people if you raise that wage. So what you'd rather do is uh, do something like a, a, a tax credit where if, if, you, if you're only on a low salary, maybe you get money uh, back rather than have to pay tax. And that's a way of increasing the income without increasing the wage. Um, and uh, another thing that you could do is, is uh, so, so what we find in our country is some of the people that, that, sometimes the hardest people that need to get their first job are young people that have no experience, that don't have a family. So uh, another proposal is to have a minimum wage, but only for people of a certain age or people with families and not applying across the board because that will make it harder for young people to get started you know, in the workplace. Uh, so uh, it's a very complicated issue, but, but ultimately all of these solutions are, are not solutions. They're just sort of band-aids to help people in the short run. The real solution is we have to increase the skill level in this country. We have to make the infrastructure better so it's more efficient. Uh, you know, we have to uh, create incentives so there's more investment, so there's more investment coming in. Uh, I showed a chart today that foreign investment into Mauritius is not very high relative to other, other countries. And uh, uh, we need more companies deciding that they want to do business here. That, that's a solution to the problem, uh, but, but minimum wage uh, uh, is, is sort of a transition. And, um, you know, we are debating it very actively in the U.S., and, and, and I think it, there's a tendency to think that, you know, the people, that, particularly people on the on the on the liberal side, you know, uh, on the left, uh, believe that it's just not fair for people to get paid uh, not enough to support their family. And and but the trouble is that um, what what's fair is uh, is uh, is a complicated question. And uh, you know, if if people have if they're, if, they're, if they're well trained and well educated and, and skilled and hard working, then they're going to earn a good wage. So you don't want to create a society where everybody feels that they deserve a wage, that they don't have to earn the wage, that they don't have to make themselves more skilled to get the wage. And so this is a very delicate issue. And many countries have made mistakes by uh, providing too much government support. Uh, for uh, individuals in, in too many areas and then, and then you lose the motivation, you lose the incentives for the population to kind of, you know, strive to, to do better. And, um, you know, with free, you already got free health and you got free education and, and, and now if you get a certain salary just for showing up, uh, then, then, then you start to wonder where there's a tipping point in terms of the vitality and the entrepreneurialism and the motivation of the people. So that's a long answer, but this is a very, very sophisticated, subtle issue. And there's no consensus, even among economists uh, who often think they know more than they really know, there's, there's not a consensus on exactly how to go forward here with this issue. Anywhere in the world, not, not just in Russia. What have been the response concerning the CSV, the creating shared value from the motion but, but, but you met afterwards. Do they agree with that concept of uh, the CS, CSV? Here or yeah. elsewhere? No, here in Mauritius. Because you know, we, didn't, we didn't have a, a much chance to discuss that issue. I can tell you on a, on a global basis, this idea has been taken up more rapidly and more globally than almost anything I've ever done before. I think there's a tremendous hunger in the business community to want to contribute to society. But business hasn't known how to do that. And, you know, we've tried, you know, philanthropy and CSR programs, but those don't make much of an impact. And so I think, I think businesses are excited about the idea that they could actually go out and and, and, and do something really important for their society, not just make money, but, but really create shared value. Uh, and uh, you know, we have a shared value institute now uh, that's kind of a think tank that is leading the shared value movement on a global basis. We have 
hundreds and hundreds of, of, uh, of firms that are uh, affiliated uh, and they're providing shared value advice to, to companies uh, all over the world. Uh, uh, and so it's been a tremendous, it's been a great source of, of pride and satisfaction to me that the business community was ready for this perspective. Uh, I mean, 10 or 20 years ago, you know, people in business were cynical and they thought my job is to make money and, and leave me alone. I don't have to worry about all this social stuff. That's, that's the problem with somebody else. But now I think in this age of, of today, where business is, I think, looking for a role uh, in society that goes beyond just maximizing shareholder value. I mean, I don't know many people many young people in particular, who want to spend their life with the purpose of maximizing shareholder value. And, you know, are we alive to do that? You know, but most people like, want something more. They want to feel like they're having a really a positive impact on their community and on their society. So this notion of shared value is starting to provide some of the intellectual framework for how a business might do that. And, We've been very, very excited by the by the response all over the world. There's a, a, a I, I mentioned in my lecture that there's a, a nonprofit firm that I founded with uh, Mark Kramer called FSG, um, and uh, FSG.org is their website. And uh, you will find on that website just an amazing amount of uh, fascinating work in many different sectors about how it is that companies do create shared value. And we're, we're very excited about this. And we think this can actually change the whole attitude of the public to business. Right now, uh, certainly in our country, the public in general is not necessarily, uh, doesn't have a lot of trust in business. And uh, you know, there's too many people that think that profit is bad. And somehow, if a company makes a profit, it's taking from society. But actually, it's the opposite. If you make a profit, you create the opportunity to grow in society. And and uh, and we have to, to to deal with this misunderstanding and this these attitudes that have grown in some parts of the world. I think I think business has to re-examine its role and re-examine how it can do business better. So uh, I, I, we're very we're very pleased by the response to this argument. Any more question? We take one more question, please. Anybody uh, from the back? So one last question, a general question. There are signs of world recovery of economy. Uh, how do you prepare a uh, small country, small developing states like Mauritius, prepare for that recovery? Uh, for the, I say again, the question, the beginning of your question. There are signs of uh, economic recovery. Yeah. Yeah. How do small countries, small developing countries like Mauritius, prepare for that recovery? Well, I mean, you know, Mauritius has historically been very oriented towards Europe in, in terms of its uh, its trade, and uh, um, and uh, I do believe there are, you know, starting to be signs of uh, certainly some recovery in the European markets. That would be a good thing. I mean, Africa has been growing pretty well. You know, for the last decade, um, and I think uh, you know, despite the fact that part of our thinking has to do with targeting Africa, you know, as, as an export base and as a partnership base, I think that we still have limited progress so far in in that. So I, I think a, a small country uh, like Mauritius just needs to relentlessly upgrade its capabilities, its infrastructure. Uh, its logistics uh, uh, and, and yes, become more and more open and connected to the rest of the of the world. And I think uh, I do believe in the African opportunity. I think uh, there's a tremendous deficit of capabilities in most of the African countries that we have people here in this country that are very well qualified. So in terms of services, in terms of a whole variety of industries, uh, I think that that's a potential. So. So I, I don't think there's anything special to do to prepare for recovery. I think I think what you what you have to do is just get the fundamentals right. And uh, you know uh, the only way I got to my seminar this morning on time was we had a policeman stop the traffic. 
And, you know, that's a problem. It's not efficient. You know, if you get stuck in traffic every day, you know, and uh, if the trucks can't move to deliver their goods, and, and if you can't get a high bandwidth, high speed, you know, internet connection, you know, all those things are just obstacles that are, that are making it harder. And, and so we got to get on with fixing those things. And, and I think the recovery should open up some space for this country to expand uh, its, its exports, but we need a strategy and we need to be cultivating these relationships with our neighbors and, and, and doing deals and having trade delegations and, uh, and, and uh, you know, hosting delegations from countries here to show them what they can, what they can do here. And so I think there's a lot of steps that can be taken. Um, to take advantage, hopefully, of the recovery, but it all starts with the basics. Uh, the skills of the worker, the infrastructure that you operate in, the ability to communicate, the logistics and efficiency of moving stuff around, all those things are, all those things are what really turns out to matter. Um, there's, there's no magic. This is, at some level, this is very simple. You know, why is Singapore got $40,000 of GDP per capita? Because they're just real class. In infrastructure, in their port, in their efficiency, in their airport, in their logistics. They're a very hospitable place to do business. They have very talented people. They have a very, very disciplined, high quality education system. They have many of their citizens now go on to universities. The Singapore universities are getting better and better. Uh, you know, they're not Harvard, you know, lucky for us, they're not Harvard yet, but they're getting much better. And they relentlessly in a very determined way, just pushed up everything in Singapore. That's why they have a higher per capita income, because they've earned it. And, uh, and, and Singapore has a very strong uh, culture of self-evaluation. Uh, and they don't think they're great. They, they, every, every morning in Singapore, the government wakes up and they say, oh my gosh, we're scared. What do we need to do to stay ahead? And that's the way they think. And they're benchmarking and comparing and traveling around the world and, and trying to figure out you know, how this little, small island nation can survive because they don't have any natural resources except the ocean around them. So, so you know, there's a mindset, a mentality. And I think, uh, you know, my feeling is that this country is a little bit complacent, doing okay. You know, we're, you know, we look backwards; it looks pretty good. And uh, but you know, there's some we have to raise the bar here. And uh, I, you know, I think we need to, and, and that's going to happen if all of you uh, collectively uh, want that to happen. Uh, that's something that citizens have to want to happen. The business community in particular, I think, has to take a leadership role. So uh, that would be that would be my opinion. And, uh, but I, I do want to emphasize, I'm, I'm not prepared to, to, to make a strategy recommendation for the I, I It's an interesting question. Uh, I have a lot of thoughts, but uh, you know, we have to we have to do a lot of work to to be at that point where we know exactly what directions to go in. I, the, the, I, this presentation that I did today had a lot of data. And I encourage you to look at it, and uh, and then I suspect that the people sitting in this room can figure out what to do. You don't need me, uh, because I, I think I gave you the key principles of it. So thank you all for coming, and uh, it's been a real honor to be here. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. So, uh, uh, allow, allow me. Uh, I hope there's no more question. Uh, on behalf of the BSP Group, although we are a very young company, and you see our. Uh, Determination. So what advice, what do you see uh, in the future for the business? I know you cannot assess it all, but at yeah. least you have seen our uh, the structure. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think you've created an interesting group that, that is synergistic, where the businesses are really reinforcing each other. Uh, I think this positioning focused on SMEs is something that uh, I think is uh, a, a, a very powerful idea, and if you can deliver on that, I think that's not only going to be a very valuable uh, uh, franchise here, but I think it's going to be valuable just about everywhere, uh, you know, in this region. And so this is an opportunity to take this and, and regionalize it and build on it, and, and uh, 
you know, there's a tendency for firms uh, in your field to want to, you know, serve the big clients. But the biggest need uh, for the kind of services you provide are actually in these middle-sized companies. Not the little companies that are always going to have five people, but the companies that can go from 10 to 20 to 50 to 100 to 200 employees, it's those companies that are critically important to economic growth and uh, often lack professional services of high quality. Uh, so uh, uh, I, you know, I commend you for uh, where you've come so quickly and uh, I think the, the building of the school is also a very important contribution to the to the human resources of the country and so uh, you know I'm, I'm optimistic that we'll see a good future. And your overall appreciation for today's event? Uh, you know, I thought today's event was equal to the best events we have everywhere in the world. Uh, very well done, and I was very uh, pleased with the turnout uh, you know, that you know, we had today and the kind of people that came. And the fact that the president and many of the ministers were willing to devote you know, all that time to, to that, that's unusual. Uh, around the world, you, you tend to find that you know, people think they know, you know, and they're too busy. And I, I like the attitude here. There's an interest in learning and, and, and getting some new ideas. And uh, that, that's probably the best news about today's event. So thank you. Thank you very much.